Good afternoon and welcome we to the money change. panel at IoT Evolution. This is the place where we talk about the state of investments and money in the Internet of Things. And I'm Alan Proethis. I'm your moderator for today's panel. And what a panel we have. I think the brain power on this stage exceeds that of some small countries. So having said that, our format today is simple. We're going to begin with our panelists providing a short uh, self-introduction. And then we're going to dive into a wide variety of topics, time permitting. We'll wrap up with a lightning round, which is always exciting, and then some audience questions. So having said that, let me get started again. I'm Alan Perwethis. I um, lead Capstone Partners, a strategic advisory firm for high growth technology companies. But up until earlier this month, I was the president of North America for Sigfox. Alex? Uh, a number of you in the room probably know me anyway from these uh, sessions. Alex Brisbane, I was co-founder of uh, Core Wireless uh, back in 2003. Core grew to being the, uh, the largest non-carrier provider of managed um, uh, IoT M2M connectivity services. Um, almost 10 million connections I think we now have today. I rather happily uh, retired uh, in November of last year and handed over the reins to uh, Rommel Bal, who is uh, heading uh, Core into its third chapter. Um, Aegis has been my uh, own investment vehicle for uh, a number of years, predominantly, oddly enough, in another area of TMT called movie production, uh, which is now where I'm spending a certain amount of my time while I'm not actually having fun watching what's going to happen to the IoT business. Thanks for bringing me onto this panel, Alan and Carl. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Fred Thiel. Um, I am the uh, founder and uh, chairman of Thiel Advisors. Uh, we're a boutique firm that focuses on providing uh, insights into technology and how it can transform businesses. Spent many, many, many years running technology companies, both in the IoT space and outside, and spend a lot of time today working with private equity firms and other investors to help them understand where they should be putting their money to work, what companies are attractive as acquisitions, and how to create real scale in some of these uh, models in the IoT world. I'm Michael Inoche. I'm a managing director at MVP Capital, a middle market investment bank focused on M&A and capital raising. I lead the IoT uh, investment banking practice based in New York and have done uh, about 10 uh, transactions in the IoT space, uh, mostly sales to strategics of, of companies that are uh, that have uh, software and, uh, and hardware uh, business models, and um, happy to be here. I'm James Torino, I'm a managing partner with Drake Star Partners based in New York. Drake Star is a 15 year old firm focused exclusively on technology, media, and communications, investment banking. Um, we've been banking the IoT sector for a while, over a decade, I guess. We've worked with a number of counterparties. Uh, that you probably recognize, folks like Inmarsat and Tata Communications and Nokia and others, as well as a number of private equity firms. Um, the group is about 75 bankers uh, located across 10 offices, uh, and New York uh, is our headquarters. So I'm uh, Greg Michu with Woodside Capital Partners. We're a, a mid market investment bank, also headquartered in Silicon Valley with an office in London, about 30 professionals, and I focus on the IoT sector for our firm. We publish research in addition to doing uh, investment banking in the space. I've done probably about a dozen deals also. Uh, most recently, uh, sold a company called IQP to GE Digital, and I also sold a company called iDevices to Hubble, which is about a $7 billion market cap electronics infrastructure company. <clears throat> and I'm James Bram. I'm uh, Founder and Chief Technology Evangelist, James Bremen Associates. We're a, a uh, boutique market research and consulting firm focused solely on IoT, but I work a lot with uh, guys like this uh, all day long and companies looking to sell themselves. So thanks, gentlemen. Great, uh, incredible expertise on this stage. So let's start out with uh, just a light level recap of 2017. So we saw another very exciting year in terms of M&A between iTron, Silver Spring, uh, the roll up there, the still pending acquisition of NXP by Qualcomm, and then Qualcomm being attempted to be gobbled up by a bigger fish. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the fundraising side, you saw some good things like Ala Networks pulling in another 60 million. We saw Actility raising 75. And the interesting thing about that to me is they made a point in mentioning in their press release how it didn't involve any bankers. Sounds like someone had a bad relationship. And then uh, in Foghorn, in the analytics space, raised 45 million across two rounds as well. 
So there's always a lot going on, but let me start out with Alex saying, you know, there's always to me a tug between strategic out there and financial investors. And valuations have been getting a little uh, exciting over the last couple of years. I mean, how do you see that pull in 2018 in terms of dominance? Uh, I think what you've seen actually in the majority of the changes which you've just alluded to in 2017 is what would be seen as being strategic deals. Mm -hmm. um, ones where essentially pieces of technology distribution, um, ability to add immense value to a, a, a broader solution set um, had additive value beyond the financial uh, constructs. You know, financial Investors inevitably are looking at uh, things in a you know somewhat different different mold, whether it's PA, whether it's obviously a hedge, whether it's uh, uh, venture capital. Um, but nevertheless, the, the fundamentals of a business model um, are, uh, are are prevalent. If you look at a more recent one, we've seen with Sierra and Numerix, uh, for example. Um, it works really well as a strategic deal. It would never have worked from a financial sponsor's perspective. Um, so I think as we'll see, we'll see, in my opinion, we'll see more strategic moves during 2018 and 2019 um, in, in larger scale deals. But I think there's still a lot of money looking for homes in niche parts of the IoT segment, notably around blockchain, around IoT security, and other related areas where you're betting on, on something which is going to evolve over a three, four, five year period. Um, and I think that's at the lower end of the marketplace, and the higher end is likely to be more strategic. Hmm. And, and Fred, let me throw it to you because you're advising a lot of these firms. And you know, one thing I hear consistently, and I talk to a lot of private equity firms myself, and, and one gets the impression, although it's never this easy, of course, that there's money sloshing about everywhere. And they keep saying, bring me a, a, something of scale, a scale investment. I don't want to talk about 5 million, 20 million, 50 million. I got money to put to work here. I mean, look at the SoftBank money being thrown around the world right now. So what are you hearing if that's just about from the private equity side? Well, the private equity business, per se, and IoT aren't the ideal match to start with. because. IoT, it's either very big companies or it's a lot of small companies. And the small companies are starting to get some scale. But the typical PE buyer, you know, we want five to $10 million of EBITDA minimally, ideally $50 million of top line. Well, a strategic has already acquired that company yeah. before they get to that scale. And on top of it, the private equity buyer typically wants a platform company, which means we want a management team that can take this to 500 million or $250 million. Um, and we can do lots of tuck-ins. And the minute they start thinking of doing tuck-ins, then they're competing also, again, with the strategic buyers. And um, by tuck-ins, I mean smaller stage technology companies that maybe don't have very well-evolved sales and marketing groups, but have a core product that's really good that would fit well in whatever solution set the platform company is selling. So it's a challenge. And um, you know, the private equity model requires companies that cash flow. You can't be funding growth through losses mm -hmm. and uh, pumping in equity. And so it's the earlier stage companies are attractive to growth capital from the venture world and strategics. Um, and the minute they get any sort of scale, ideally the strategics are buying and uh, effectively taking them off the market. And so it's a challenging market. But what's interesting is uh, last year and especially the year before, PE firms were being um, were outbidding strategics. Mm -hmm. And it was really most deals were PE guys fighting against each other. And the multiples were two times to nearly three times what the PE firms were really comfortable paying five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to see a comeuppance here as the cycle changes a little bit, where all of a sudden. Especially because it seems like their time frames have compressed a bit too. Absolutely. You know, it's not the five to seven years it was of a number of years ago. It seems to be inside five years, and they prefer it a little less. But I see Greg nodding his head down there. Now we see. I think you know, relative to what you're saying on you know private equity firms outbidding strategics, we've seen that also. Yep. More for software deals, yep. more mat more mature businesses, and they definitely have to have that kind of profitability mm -hmm. you're talking about. You know, I think relative to a lot of IoT companies, they're you know earlier stage yep. you know, still. So. Um, so, so we talked about private equity, and again, I, I, um, my personal thing is you're right in that. I think the valuations have gotten a little out of hand. But frankly, even if you look at some of the valuations of, I mean, this is a, a matter of argument, but uh, whether you look at the Numerex, whether you look at the uh, Cisco acquisition of Jasper, 
um, I would argue they were pretty, pretty aggressive uh, valuations. But uh, Michael, what are you seeing in terms of valuations out there as part of the work you're doing? Yeah, you know, I think I think that one of the big drivers of valuations right now is is uh, the debt markets have become very supportive. You know, just in the last three to four years, in a lot of uh, you know recapitalizations that a private equity firms have have done with companies, they've you know gotten leveraged usually based on EBITDA of two to three times more than what they would have gotten four or five years ago, and that just increases the IRR they're able to attain, and that's really translated almost into an exact you know, increase in, in the valuations yep. that they're, they're willing to pay. So I think that there will be a comeuppance, but it'll be more when the debt markets decide to correct and you know, reduce the leverage you know, or the you know, rates that they're uh, prepared to charge. But what do you think that's gonna be? I mean, it just seems like there's such an amazing amount of money out there from all these sources. Yep. I mean, to me, I mean, you see the pressure, especially in the last month on the dollar, um, because there's just so much excess capital about. I mean, when does I, that happen? Yeah, I don't think, though, that that'll change. You know, the target IRRs that private equity firms uh, aim to achieve has not changed. So if, if the leverage levels come down, if interest rates go up, uh, then, you know, that will translate into a reduction in valuation uh, for sure. I think you look at the stock market, you know, we're hitting all-time highs, you know, every year, you know, for the last several years. Every and week. Continue every week. And so that allows strategics to pay more because their you know, stock and their valuations are, are you know, multiples higher than they were before. So that's, those are kind of the two factors that I think that are driving valuations right now in the market. Yeah, it's, I, I think back to uh, some of the old investor comments, like when I know people back home who own pizza places or uh, you know, other things like that, and they start talking to you about their great Bitcoin or cannabis investment in the market. Uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, please don't do that. Don't, you know, just take your money, go on vacation. Live, live. Um, James Torino, um, you guys, I think, have really done an incredible amount of transactions in the past year. And, uh, you know, and the thing about your transactions is that some of them are more in sort of the infrastructure level of IoT. I mean, what do you see out there in terms of the trends, in terms of private equity versus uh, strategic versus perhaps some other things? Yeah, I, I'd say I would agree with a lot of what's been said. We've seen private equity outbid strategics on a number of our recent uh, sell-side deals. This is something that we see, uh, I'd say, quite commonly. And I think I attributed a lot of it to just supply and demand characteristics of the market today. I think that could change with interest rates. I think it could change just with a normal business cycle that the operations of these companies tend to slow down. Um, and I think it is, for, for private equity, it's a challenging market. I think they're all looking for deals in that same sort of zip code. There's a lot of competition if they're even around. They all like recurring revenue models, to be sure. And I think the ones that we've seen succeeding in this market are the ones that are willing to look at maybe special situations or carve-outs or something that's maybe not just completely packaged with a, with a bow. Um, I think the question that we're looking at and, and sort of keenly interested in is with the tax legislation and the repatriation of, of cash into the U.S. market, whether there won't be more pressure on the part of the strategics to make some acquisitions here. So, That's right. you know, we, we still see this as a vibrant M&A market. You know, we track overall volume in the market. 2016 would prove probably to be sort of the, the lightning rod year just because you had so many big deals like the ARM transaction, you had Jasper, you had Fleetmatics. We haven't seen the same level of sort of, you know, billion dollar plus deals in 2017. But the volume of deals, the number of deals is still pretty steady. So we see this still as a consolidating market. And, uh, you know, looking at a positive pipeline, frankly, for 2018. Is it fair to say since the market continues to just roar, and I haven't checked it this week, but uh, it just keeps going up and up and up. And to me, that tells me if I'm a company that's publicly traded, I want to use my stock as currency if I'm going to do some M&A transactions versus private equity using cash. I mean, can you see more of that trend of the market going up supporting more of a strategic using stock for these? You know, things? it's a good question. We, we always expect to see maybe a stock introduced as part of an offer on a deal. And for the most part, you know, any of the large strategics tend to just use their cash. So They have so much cash right yeah, now, they do. most of those large companies. The ones where you see stock would tend to be maybe more of a middle market buyer where cash is a little bit more of a scarce resource. So you, we see it occasionally. But frankly, very few of our sell side deals have involved anything other than cash. I'd say. And the access to cash has been so The good. access to cash, the access to cheap debt, you know, all, all of those things sort of combined. Exactly. 
Yeah, I was uh, trying to explain the uh, weighted uh, average cost of capital to my uh, freshman son in finance. <laughs> and because uh, they were going through these things. And uh, it, it's just amazing how low the cost of capital is for large companies right now. It, it just To me, it's just a supply and demand imbalance yep. uh, reflected in that. So James Brem, you um, are the sole pure analyst up here, or as I think of you, consigliere to people making big decisions in INT. And I know that you get a question that I get a lot, but even more so, about, again, whether you're a strategic, whether you're a private equity, everybody is certain of the long-term potential of IoT, but how do you act upon that in the short term with your money? You know, I constantly think back of the stories from 130 years ago about the, all the different train companies or the hundreds of car companies. You knew the industry was going to win, but, but who do you actually bet on to make money? You know, besides the part suppliers. So how do you advise someone, which you do every day, when, when they approach you with this question? Who am I advising? Am I advising a private equity firm that's looking to purchase, or am I advising you know, a, a vendor that's looking to be acquired? Let's start with private equity, because of uh, money, money. So I guess um, my view of the world may be a little bit different than, than some of them up here, because I believe that we are at a, 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 a pinnacle, and it's even growing higher on the number of transactions that private equity will be doing and, and are doing. Um, we've done three diligence deals in three months, and we've got a backlog of, of projects to do for, for companies out there. But what's the first thing we do? We take a look at them, and we, we find out how that private equity wants to operate its organization. Are they looking for a centerpiece to build around? A lot of times a company is looking for a centerpiece, buys that first, to build around. You know, Alex Brisbane did a great job building the biggest um, non-carrier wireless carrier out there. I mean, tremendous. <laughs> and they built around that, and, they, and, they, and, and he went out and, and just acquired great assets to, to, to add to that. That's what some of these private equity firms are looking at, who are. And there's so many companies out there uh, right now for sale that... They're not sure what they do. So then you ask them, what about management team? Do you want to run it yourself, or do you want to just invest in it? Absolutely. Because that's, that's a big thing. Yep. Getting the culture correct on these deals when, when they're done is, then you take a look at the technology. Does the technology jive? This looks a lot like the uh, VOIP era or the hosting era you know, of, the, of the last 10, 15, 20 years, where we had all these massive number of companies out there, and private equity came in, and strategics came in and, and bought pieces, and they didn't fit together. The technologies didn't work, so we, we saw incredible churn. Well, we don't want that. We don't need that at all. Um, the cultures clashed. You, you had a very um, loose culture, t-shirt wearing, flip-flop wearing culture on one end of the coast, and, you know, and, and, and suits and ties at the other. And those things don't, don't work. So you have to take a look at, at all of those pieces. But then, at the end of the day, IoT is, is um, there are a lot of horizontal platforms that can do a lot of different vertical solutions. Who are you? What's your identity want to be in the future? Do you want to be a horizontal platform with a lot of different vertical solutions, or do you want to specialize and be the best vertical provider out there? Right? Then you build around that. So we have a lot of different discussions. Those are some of the things that we take a look at, and probably, probably uh, I'm missing you know, a handful more, and like, like how much are you going to ultimately spend on this thing? How, how committed are you? You know, it's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting conversation when you talk about a specific thing. One of the things I like to talk about is IoT doesn't really exist, but there are about 10,000 use cases we put all in the same basket we call IoT. And it's funny when you have a conversation with someone saying, would you like to buy some IoT? What are you talking about? I need to monitor this remote thing and get the data and do something with it. I don't need this IoT stuff. And because the buyer actually doesn't realize that what they're buying from us is what we think of IoT half the time. And it's a very interesting dichotomy in perspective from the supplier and the financial ecosystem, I think, in the business from the actual customer ecosystem. You know, go to a, uh, an elevator convention you know, and find out it's over three trips to fix the average elevator. You know, it's, all, it's hard problems like that. So, Alex, I want to come back to you because, you know, you've been on the finance side of the world, but you're an actual company operator and builder. Mm -hmm. And when you had to think about getting the financial partnership together to really turbocharge your business, 
And I give you a lot of credit because you were really one of the earliest guys to get that kind of backing to go big fast. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a bet that most people either didn't have the forethought to make or just the aggressiveness to make. What was your thinking about how you decided on a particular uh, private equity company to work with versus perhaps raising money some other ways? First of all, I should apologize to Michael you know, because we didn't quite make it with MVP at the time. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, the reality is that we, um, somewhere between uh, reasonable you know, execution and pure dumb luck, we ended up creating a reasonably sound basic footing uh, of, um, of the business since we started it back in 2003. We were one of those first people to actually create platforms around uh, IoT. Now there's 450 odd platforms apparently in this industry today, so we better start defining what a platform is, whether it's an SDK from a hardware manufacturer to you know, a, a Watson-based service. Mm -hmm. you know, they're all over the map. And I think that's probably, by the way, one of the clarifying works which we have to do as an industry over the next um, period of time anyway is to do some definitional work around platforms. But I think the magic pass at the Disney Parks is a platform as well. It uh, almost certainly is. It almost certainly is. So um, we, we first of all built a reasonably good franchise, it's fair, it's fair to say, um, uh, with unique technology, um, a good customer base, and, uh, and also sound financials. Mm -hmm. Financials which would work in the context of taking them to a financial uh, sponsor. And then as founders, we were really faced with an interesting dilemma. The business at that time was, uh, as, as Fred indicated a little earlier, uh, we were, whatever we were, 60, 70 million dollars of revenues. We were 20 something million dollars of EBITDA. So we were kind of in a nice little interesting sweet spot. And the last thing we wanted to do was to be acquired by a strategic, because we believed that we'd end up uh, be ending up in the, the stomach of a whale somewhere, <laughs> and, uh, and, and all the good work which we put in in the past 10 years would essentially be um, coming out of the rear end of the whale at mm -hmm. a particular point. <laughs> After full digestion. After entirely full digestion. Yeah. Um, and, but, so, so you're faced with, did you want to be, <coughs> let me call it, a great ACE hardware store and make good money? Mm do whatever we want it to be, or did we kind of aspire to being Home Depot? And uh, to aspire to being Home Depot, we had to invest more, uh, but we had to have, frankly, larger checks to acquire because we believed that the business at that time, this would be 2013, 2012, 2013, it was still um, very um, uh, uh, diverse, in fact, very fragmented. And usually, business industries consolidate when they've matured. Mm -hmm. This industry needed consolidation because it didn't have scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we believed that scale mattered. Um, uh, buying power, frankly, and in, in impact with, uh, with our carrier partners in those cases. Spreading our R&D costs over a large base. Uh, being able to reach um, customers in a different kind of universe, mm -hmm. particularly the enterprise customer. Uh, which, you know, enterprises do business with enterprises. Absolutely. You know? And as a result, you know, we had to have that scale. And frankly, we had geographic um, views. So we took our thesis to the market. We, were, uh, we, we frankly had very good uh, investment bankers in New York. And we were very careful about um, who we selected. Uh, in the end, we wanted to have a private equity partner who truly was going to be a partner. And the folks across the desk believed in our thesis. And frankly, we're going to be the same people that we would work with in the forthcoming three or four years. I mean, I've, you know, I, uh, I've, as I said, I've recently retired, and I'd like to think I'm a young 67-year-old, but nevertheless, the fact is that uh, what I didn't want is a 32-year-old Columbia MBA looking over my shoulder, telling me how to run the business, because that wasn't going to go very far, you know, in, in our relationship. And so that became part of, it, if you like, a mutuality of our buying of our private equity partner, and, and it worked out quite well for us. It doesn't work out every, well for absolutely everybody, I'll be, be honest. That chemistry, that understanding of what that, uh, that those goals are over three or five years, 
really is very, very, very important, uh, uh, quite, quite honestly. And James made an interesting point a little earlier about um, uh, styles. Uh, it's not just styles between your financial partner um, and, um, and, and, and yourselves. It's styles between your financial partners and the differing parts of your own business. Mm -hmm. Our business is different in Australia than it is in, in the United States. It's different in, in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. frankly, to the, to the UK. And we have to figure out how to manage those cultures. And those cultures then have to be filtered through to our, our financial uh, sponsors uh, as well. But at the end of the day, you have to give them back what they came in for. And that is um, good returns. And uh, through dumb luck, we've been able to do that. Well, I think it's a little bit more than luck. Uh, but you're right about the style and that one of the things I've seen, and I know CEOs, you know, I, I actually saw an interesting statistic that 20 years ago, there were a little over 8,000 listed companies. Today, there's a little over 4,000, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Through strategic acquisition, but especially a lot of, I don't want to pick on private equity too much, but a lot of private equity activity. So there's a lot more people in the industry who work for private equity <coughs> managers. And probably, I'd say the majority are drive-by spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good or bad, but I, I know some CEOs that say, you know what? I know exactly where the numbers are I got to hit. I know it's crystal clear what I got to do every quarter. And if I put up more than one strategic slide, they're like, yeah, that's very nice. But, you know, where are we at in the numbers for next quarter? And some people like that. So I think the clarity, I think, is, is the important. important thing. But Fred, you know, turn around the other side. I think when you have that kind of EBITDA and revenue, <clears> you're at that sweet spot where you're going to have a line down the hall of people wanting to talk to you. But what about if things, you know, the fruit's a little bumped on the edges sometimes, you know? But there's still some good flavor there. I mean, how do you look at assets that could be good assets, but maybe aren't perfect assets out there? How do you, how do you view that? Well, it, you know, it comes down to a question about um, what types of bumps or hair is there on the, mm -hmm. on the target? Because, um, you know, if you are typically buying something to fill a gap in the strategy, Right? You've got some core pieces and you're missing this one particular aspect, this one particular component to what you're going to deliver to the marketplace. And so you find some companies that have that and then you look at, okay, now I'm going to acquire this. And the question is, is the bump on something that you don't need? So for example, if you are a platform company and you already have sales marketing and good penetration of markets, but what you need is a product line extension or a core component, you just want product and technology. You don't really care about sales. You don't care about marketing. So if the bumps are in the sort of back office and the sort of non-core product or technology pieces, then that's a, an easy tuck-in for a PE firm or a strategic to do. It's more when the bump is in, oh, there's a core piece of the IP that the company actually doesn't own, or they've lost a core competency to deal with it, or maybe there's a licensing issue. Um, something that you don't really discover till you're pretty far do down due diligence, and then the deal breaks, and as the bankers on the panel <laughs> realize, you know, a broken deal is sold at a discount um, because typically somebody says, okay, there was hair on it, it must be really bad hair, therefore mm. I might bid it as a fire sale, but um, it's tough. And I think most of the private equity buyers today, as well as the strategic buyers, they're looking for some particular characteristics in a company. And that could be um, a product, a customer set. It could be a particular management skill. And they're willing to buy sort of one or more of those three aspects in what they're trying to do. And if they can't, if they don't find it in due diligence, then they'll just move on and it's next. Because they're on this you know, three to five year timeline where you've got to execute, you've got to drive this growth, and you're looking for the fastest and most capital efficient way of getting there. Mm -hmm. And anything that introduces friction into that process and grows risk is a bad thing. Yeah. You know, I'd actually just like to maybe add something to that because, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about the, you know, IoT, and this is relatively, still a relatively early days in this industry. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd highlight that, you know, you've got, there's a lot of major platforms out there, you know, the, the Siemens platform, the IBM Watson platforms, where, you know, these are platforms that, you know, G Digital, for instance, where companies have put major money into trying to get these platforms going. And there were some comments made earlier in the day that, you know, Where's the revenue? Where's the profit mm -hmm. from these platforms, right? And you know, I think the technologies, their technologies are still evolving. And I think that there's a lot of you know, strategic acquisitions, which are they're acquiring earlier stage technology companies. In some cases, they're paying you know, fairly decent returns to the investors on them. But you know, those companies are relatively early in their product cycles. They're early in, but they have 
kind of core strategic technologies that they can kind of bolt in alongside to try to round out their platform. Maybe there's some access to customers that they get, but you know, I think it has a lot to do with kind of where the evolution of this this market is, mm -hmm. you know, on, and some of the strategic deals versus the more mature, you know, they're acquiring the kind of companies and private equities. But you know, use Siemens as an example. So um, I did a panel last uh, year in Munich at BMW, and I had uh, Dr. Rusvarm, who's a former Siemens board member, was CTO of their healthcare business, and Siemens can't innovate any faster than one and a half times slower than the market evolves. And they're really good at engineering complex solutions. They created an innovation model that allows people from inside Siemens to leave Siemens and start ventures and they'll fund them and they'll acquire them. And he said, you know, threw his hands up in the air, listen, we can't acquire companies and integrate them because there's cultural issues. Anything that's not invented in Siemens is not invented here. He said, we can't run these as standalone companies. So we're seriously considering just breaking ourselves into bits, a gr group of bits and pieces that are specialists. And I think that's what's going to happen here. The problem is a lot of these early startups um, have got great technologies, but they don't have a, a way to get through and into the captive market, which the large industrial MES guys can actually deliver. But there's friction on both sides. The venture-backed the venture -backed or early stage companies have cultural clash with the MES guys, and the MES guys don't really know what to do with this technology because it hasn't been industrially developed. I, I, all, will I, yeah. all will scale enough to move exactly. the needle on, yep. on, on their own business radar screen, yes, exactly. which is why it's the, the, young, the young stage companies start filling in some of the gaps. Yep. Okay. I, I agree with Fred's comment earlier that um, you know if it's a capability buy, you know you can have a lot of warts on the company, and you know a strategic is just really focused on a product extension or furthering their own technology or capabilities. But I think, you know, I think a common theme amongst strategic and private equity investors is revenue growth, mm -hmm. and I think that there can be a lot of different issues with the company. But if you don't have revenue growth, it really doesn't matter how great the technology is yep. in most cases because that's usually. Yeah. Uh, determine of really yeah. the attractiveness of the product. Yeah. Yeah. The market. Well, the market tells you. You may not yeah. like the answer. Yeah. But the well, market always tells you. But a lot of times, a lot of companies are built by tech or are founded and built by technologists, and they tend to look at you know the sales and marketing organization is a little suspect because it's foreign to them. They don't really get the salespeople. When you're an engineer or a technologist, you you kind of think that you know the sales and marketing is a little fuzzy. Problem is is then they usually overinvest on the technology side, hired you know too much in R and D, really trying to make their product just that much better. Where they really should put those extra dollars in sales and marketing to really get further traction in the market and really increasing revenue growth, because that will really increase the value of a company, having 20% plus revenue growth per year than having the perfect product. Yep. Oh, brand is everything. You know, I, I am a huge believer in brand. I, I've got a, a, a mentor who built a company. Founder, founder of the company, built it from scratch, invested his own money, uh, finally took uh, 40 million in, uh, in, in uh, capital, venture capital, sold the, took, took the company IPO, sold it to a private equity firm this year for $6 billion, okay? Um, he, he gave me a lot of advice along the way and he, and he said these things about what he has seen and what they have done, at, what they did as an organization. A lot of companies don't ask what, why, and how. What do I need to add to my portfolio? Why can't I do it myself? Mm -hmm. And how do I get a hold of it? And, and mm -hmm. we talked, uh, I was going to have an hour long call with him, and, it, and uh, we started at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and ended at 6.15 one night. And we ended up going <coughs> down a path talking about Cisco. And Cisco 10 years ago and 15 years ago and their acquisition process versus Cisco today. Yep. And, and how they were able to identify those core tenets, those core things. What do I need and how am I going to get it? And shuck the rest. I remember they, they acquired a company, um, a, a small startup company, for one employee. One employee that had a whole bunch of intellectual property. And it killed the whole rest of the company. Um, you know, so it's about integrating fast and we're not doing that anymore. Well, it's a portfolio approach, I would suggest, that some of them are going to blow up. But again, you, you pick enough winners out of the whole portfolio that you're going to do OK. And speaking of which, Shames, you know, your portfolio of activity between the interesting thing about your firm is you guys do a lot in Europe in addition to the US. And one of the things I wanted to call out is 
what are the differences you see, perhaps, between some of the trends in this space and in, in the investments in the US versus Europe? Because to me, Europe's always been very strong on sort of the concept visionary side, very strong engineering, tend to fall down a bit on business marketing execution. Whereas they probably criticize us as playing fast and loose uh, in the US uh, on the engineering sometimes, but driving ahead with the, the soft side. So how, how would you compare and contrast? It's a good, it's a good question. The, uh, you know, we, sitting in New York, as I do, I go 3,000 miles to Europe and I see a certain trend. I go 3,000 miles to the West and I see very different supply demand characteristics in the market. Um, in general, I would say, you know, if you look at tech companies in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of capital there. You tend to see, particularly for software companies, a lot of them have raised, you know, 20, maybe even 50 million at very early stages. They have big cap tables. Um, you go to Europe, interestingly, and you find a lot of these companies are bootstrapped. Yeah. If they've raised venture capital at all, it might just be in the low single digits. Mm -hmm. and, and if you really compare the products, you know, you'll find good IP being produced in yeah. Europe, and, and Western as well as Eastern Europe, yeah. I mean, all through Europe. And it's a trend that we've seen. I was talking to the uh, head of corporate development of a well-known software company um, a few months ago, and uh, he, he was looking at actually two different targets. One was in Silicon Valley, one was in Western Europe. And uh, they ended up putting in a bid in the one in Silicon Valley, and the, it was a huge amount of money, and the VCs threw up all over it, and they were very unhappy about it. They ended up offering 20% of that price to the European firm, and they, they won the deal, and yep. they were delighted. Yep. So it's a very different dynamic. Um, you know, that said, a lot of the European companies are looking to enter the US market. So they might be in the UK, or they might be in Germany, or Sweden, or France. Those are all very compartmentalized markets. And they look across the Atlantic and they see one huge monolithic market. So one of the things that we see, Alan, is a lot of these companies trying to move themselves over. We're even, in fact, we're working with a company now that's actually moved their headquarters to, uh, to the US, to the east coast of the US, just to establish a, a beachhead here for their headquarters. So that's, you know, these are some of the things that, uh, that we run into commonly. And yeah, we, we do a lot of European deals also. And I think we see something very similar in the sense, and I think it might even have to do with kind of just the way venture capital is in kind of uh, Europe versus venture capital in the US. You know, in Europe, we also see a lot of companies start out kind of bootstrapped before right. they get kind of first rounds of venture capital. And then also just that kind of level of, you know, here venture capitalists will throw a lot of money and it seems that pretty much a lot of European companies, they reach a certain point, they can do very good product development, but they just really can't get that expansion capital. It's very difficult to come by. And then they become natural acquisition targets for a lot of times U.S. companies. We, we were talking to one of the, uh, I'd say, better known venture capital uh, groups in London. They, they've done a lot of pretty hot deals. And they, they lament the fact that they're sitting in, in London supporting all these great companies. You know, all the unicorns are in Silicon Valley. So to your point about marketing, I think you find a lot of good IP, but maybe these companies are just aren't quite as used to maybe marketing themselves in the same way as you see in Silicon Valley. There's, there is a cultural difference yeah. there. Yeah, a huge cultural difference, yeah. I'd, I'd uh, probably add, being, being the person that speaks still, I think, with a transatlantic accent on, <laughs> the, uh, on the panel here, albeit having been here for 29 years. Um, some, and I'm thinking of it on the buy side as much as the, uh, the sell side, just for a moment. Somebody told me many, many, many years ago, and I've been involved with a number of deals, was um, try and avoid executive in heat uh, syndrome. You know, you, you start something, therefore you must finish it uh, kind of approach. And I must say that uh, in the last five years, we've looked at a number of deals uh, to add into to core as well. The only ones which we have rejected have been in Europe because uh, we've, we found, <coughs> and by the way, there's an interesting point about venture capital. I would say that what they think of as venture capital, we'd think of Series A almost, um, you know, uh, over there. Each and every time, we found it disappointing at the relative level of, I'm going to call it integrity of the business that we, lo we looked at. Um, systems, processes, documented IP, um, customer management, customer engagement. All of those things which, quite frankly, anybody on this panel's DD group um, would, would, would have a fit over in, in hours, and yet they'd be managing to run a business and indeed even had investment advisors. 
you know, that were still transacting for them you know, on, on the European side, they wouldn't have passed the time of day, um, passed muster actually o o over here. I think we are um, much more disciplined from a financial point of view. Converse, but when we do it, we throw a lot more money mm. at, the, uh, at, at the opportunity. But it's also logical that we do. Because if, if, you, if you think about the European side, and why, why are these companies trying to get into the North American marketplace? Because growing in Europe is hard, you know? Yep. Um, I've, I've worked with our private equity company on an acquisition which um, subsequently was successful, nothing to do with core, but with, the, with, with our private equity backers in, uh, in Scandinavia. And their problem was how do they grow even in Europe? Mm. And the answer is they've got, they've got to grow outside of Scandinavia. And to do that, you've got to think of different cultural approaches, different group ways to marketplace. And, and it's hard to make those things, those things happen. So it's easier to come to a new market. Yep. So when, when you see the real expansionists, Fleetmatics was a good example. Good Irish company, you know, many years ago, InvestCorp came into them. But they beachheaded their business into North America. Mm -hmm. They say, God damn it, it's the only place that will ultimately see a billion dollar valuation yep. for, for, for this business. Yep. It's not going to happen in Europe. And it wouldn't have happened in Europe. So I think there are still some quite fundamental differences. But I think there's a relative immaturity of the targets um, in, in Europe still, particularly but, in the small to mid size. And, and I think and I'm chairman of a German technology company that's done that leap to the US in the cybersecurity world, a mid market size company, very profitable, private equity owned. Um, the big problem is when the CEO of the German parent earns less than a salesperson in Silicon Valley. It's culturally kind of a little hard to say, well, we're going to pay this person $300,000 a year plus, you know, extra, extra, and the CEO earns, you know, $180,000, $200,000 a year. But he's on holiday for eight weeks of the year. This is true. Um. <laughs> Yeah, the, the other trick there is, too, is that I probably work with a few dozen companies in Europe bringing uh, IoT solutions to the U.S. in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I would say that 90% of them that were told they were solutions were toys. Um, they weren't yep. commercialized, that's, that's ruggedizable to scale <coughs> applications. Totally. And I still yeah. think everybody has that problem to some extent in IoT. But I think in Europe, because of the, the smaller countries, they're not used to the level of robustness you need for a scale deployment in the US quite often. It's interesting, if I, if I look 25 years ago in, 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 in telecoms, Europe was a much more demanding market. Yes, the, uh, the, the quality of technology, the way that you interrelate with your customers, the customer support experience, the, uh, the whole value pr process was much higher in Europe than it was here in North America, which was very much more sort of plug and pray over here. Um, I think there's been quite a reversal of that. Um, in, in, in recent years, uh, quite, quite frankly, where the expectations of the buyer, partly because of the scale of their deployments, is actually higher here in North America, oftentimes, than it is actually in the European market, where they're almost prepared to be uh, um, fashionistas, almost, for Well, but I would accept the Germans from that, so to be fair. Yeah. But everybody else in mainland Europe, probably not. Um, anyway, we're getting closer on time, so let me just ask uh, one or two more quick questions, and we'll go in the lightning round. Um, Michael, James, Greg, I want to get your quick opinion. We haven't talked about IPOs. What happened to the IPOs? What happened that you build a company, you get liquidity if you're going public? What happened, guys? Yeah, I, I think the government happened to IPOs. Uh, I think, uh, you know, with Sarbanes-Oxley and all the, uh, you know, rules and, and just increased scrutiny and, and regulations, just took out, you know, all the fun, you know, of running a public company. And, and it really... That's probably one piece of it, and then you had the aggressiveness of of, um, of companies, you know, just but by strategics taking it out before a company could do an IPO, as well as uh, as other you know private equity investors and private capital is willing to pay a higher valuation that's, than public. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good that's a with, good point. With no risk, you, 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 yeah. you know, yeah. private I mean, equity and growth uh, capital guys are willing to take you know give liquidity to the founder. I mean, that wasn't yep. something you necessarily yeah. saw 10 or 15 years ago. That's pretty common today. So a lot of those features that you would have seen in an IPO are now just done in the private market. Yep. And frankly, it's, it's pretty damn efficient, mm -hmm. you know, the way it's done. IPO is, is not an easy thing. Right? So you're saying take no. the government out, it's more efficient? Alan, take, take <laughs> a look at some of the companies that have IPO'd in the past in the space that we call IoT and look at the size of them. It's very hard for them right. to manage right. being a public company. Yeah. The overhead and, of being a public company. And then take a look at, at the rest of the companies out here in this space. We've already talked about it. They're pretty small. 
right? So we got to grow them up to mm -hmm. get to that IPO level. Let's ask ourselves, is, was Jasper IPOable? Really? No. From a revenue standpoint? From, I mean, they had, they had one exit. Um, you know, in the 1990s, though, when I was a securities analyst and I took public a lot of companies, they would have totally been IPO level back in those days, but absolutely. Sorry, and then we popped them up. Yeah, yeah. Then, then the the overhead of being a public company is just yeah. so much. Uh, the same argument I made to some other companies where they have really choppy revenue. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. where you can't nail that quarterly number, and nope. you're just like you're just asking for disaster every quarter if you can't build that confidence. But I think there are some good companies out there that are smaller, that are at this conference that, in two years, in three years, you're going to see some IPOs happen that are really good, solid companies. They got to prep themselves. You, you need to have a trading level to make being a public company worthwhile. Right. I mean, a lot of companies don't achieve that until they get to you know, a billion dollars in market cap or more. Being a sub-billion dollar market yeah. cap company is almost meaningless. Look at the AIM market. Yeah. So many of those companies just sit there and they don't trade. Yeah. You know, and the same thing is true you know, even with the smaller companies on NASDAQ. It's, it's a real dilemma. So you need to get cryptocurrency into your business plan. So your, your trading levels go up really quickly. I think, I think you bring a little bit of that sawtooth uh, into the uh, conversation at that point. Uh, and I actually think blockchain is perfectly suited for IoT. Uh, cryptocurrencies have their application, of course, but uh, a little different thing. Um, so with the time we have left, let's do a quick lightning round of one or two things. Um, James, let's start with you on the end there, because you are known to have an opinion. OK. OK, $100 million. You've got to make one bet, 2018. Where are you placing your bet in IoT? Wow. Oh, come on. Now I didn't know this question was coming. None of us knew that question was coming. I'm going to defer for a minute. I'll sell you a trade show. How's that sound? Uh -huh. In fact, you can get two for that, right? Two for one? Best gut reaction, James. Qualcomm stock. Qualcomm I stock. I would buy Qualcomm yeah. stock. Because someone's going to buy it. That's right. Because flat, <laughs> nothing like being flat for five Sooner years to drive acquisitions. Are we talking <laughs> IoT though? Are we talking? Are we talking Internet of Things? Yeah, somewhere in IoT. Hundred million. Where you put it? You know, I'd, I'd say probably the most compelling one that I can see right, which is still private, would be uptake in the sense that you know the company's doing significant revenues. They're you know, they've got a real business. What segment, any segments, though? Uh, well, they're, they've got kind of AI data analytics around IoT. They're going kind of vertical by vertical. They seem to, it's more of a, it seems to be more of a consulting type systems integration model, but they seem to be doing very well from a performance perspective. And what was the kind of answer I didn't hear? Uptake. Okay. Yeah. Uptake, you know, the Canadian. Or yep. Great. All right, James, where are you spending your money? Um, you know, a lot of people ask me where do they invest, and you know we've, we've thought about analytics and we've thought about software. I think one of the things that I find intriguing right now is just the whole fog computing area. Mm. I mean, I think yeah. you know if you really think about huge data centers being kind of regionally located, and you think about where the computing power really has to migrate to, it just seems to. I don't know how that's all going to shake out, but there's a huge opportunity. It's obviously going to be a capital intensive uh, exercise to move that computing power out you know, in a more distributed fashion. But it's pretty clear that the pendulum is swinging. There, if somebody was saying in the panel yesterday, they, they actually had a picture of a pendulum. It is swinging back in that direction. Yep. Michael? Yeah, if I, if I was to put it into a public company, um, you know, I would probably Could be private. Could be private. OK, it could be. But just thinking about it just in the public company landscape, I would, I would say Orbcom. I'm really, really impressed mm -hmm. with what they've done to that company. I think I've that doubled they have my a good money strategy. in the past 18 months with Herbcom already. So you're yeah. saying double down. I think so. I think it's they're still attacking a market opportunity that's underpenetrated, and I think that they have the right strategy and the right uh, you know business. You know, they're focused on sales and marketing, and they you know have great revenue growth. And I just see that continuing. It's a shame Mike Walkley uh, couldn't make it. He was supposed to be on the panel here, um, just to make it a little <laughs> bit heftier, um, but he got stuck in a blizzard in Minneapolis. But he's been a big uh, public advocate of, uh, of those guys for a while. All right, Fred, what do you think? Um, you know, I would go with computing at the edge. Um, I would stay away from hardware platforms, and I'd look at how do you build um, very strong, robust, containerized intelligence that you can put into thermostats. You, know, you can put into electric motors. You can put it all the way at the edge. The problem with today's models are that you're trying to do too much analytics, too much predictive um, calculations in the cloud, 
And these systems need to be able to operate lights out, and that dependency on the cloud just won't allow you to use that for mission critical systems. So you need to push the intelligence all the way out to the edge if possible so they're closed turnkey systems and those smart systems can then collaborate with other smart systems and you get a very decentralized, democratized, and I'm not going to use the blockchain word because it's not based on blockchain, but you get systems that interoperate Concepts. and can actually decide who's going to rule in any given situation. And you know the autonomous vehicle is the perfect example of a group of collaborative systems that interoperate with each other under a rule set that have sort of a major brain running them. But an industrial plant could be the exact same thing. Alex? Uh, don't say core. No, I won't. I've got too much in that already. <laughs> um, it, it's um, probably um, in, in and around um, extensions, really, of that concept that Fred has around smart silicon, mm -hmm. um, miniaturizing down to extremely low power capabilities yeah. for localized analytics, security, offboarding, um, OTA support over mm -hmm. narrowband mm -hmm. networks, which, well, I think I is, which is a really, support really support big that. concern, I think, for the industry. Oh, you can't put 15 years you know, of, of devices into the marketplace and embed them in concrete you know, in a bridge and not have some fairly intelligent way of being able to maintain them and, yeah. and, and, and support them. Um, and so that sort of takes me into the direction of ARM and that kind of uh, organization. But I think there's, there's also some really interesting smaller fringe players mm -hmm. around that which we could leverage too. Mm -hmm. So, so it's strange because four years ago, five years ago, I think I thought the, the hardware industry was dead, you know, uh, or it it was only looking for a place to go and die. Um, in reality, I think there's just so much change taking place in our industry space around hardware. Not only the complexity of all of the different communications technologies, but security cap uh, technologies. Dare I say it? their impact on blockchain and others. Yep. I think there's a lot of space for innovation no, it's around actually, hardware, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, which I don't think that there was. You're um, actually seeing Sandhill Road investing years ago. in semiconductor companies again, uh, which they uh, took a hiatus yeah. for about oh, five absolutely. years. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's really r ramming back into that. And, and I think you know, SoftBank's move on ARM was extremely interesting. Uh, for them to really own endpoints in the future. Right. Yeah, my vote's on the data analytics side. Uh, I, I think anything that helps get value out of data, from edge to, yeah, like, yeah. frankly, if you just had the best vibration algorithm company in the world to do everything from a lawnmower to a compressor on a fridge to a jet engine to uh, your furnace, that alone is worth a fortune. And it's crazy as it sounds. Though I would argue that today, um, you know, the you tools are, are very rapidly developing, so off the shelf, you can take anything you want to characterize mm -hmm. and identify, so and the system will build, maintain, <coughs> and adapt an algorithm in real time using just off the shelf stuff. Yeah. So the days when GE paid $100 million for what was it, smart systems, the three algorithms that mechanical turbines use, yeah. are gone. Yeah. Right. Algorithms aren't worth that much today because you don't need the human brain power to create them. You can point mm -hmm. machines at them and so very quickly. Yeah. So let's wind up with one last question. Your least favorite area of investment in IoT and the dumbest IoT thing you've seen <coughs> in the last few months. And coming out of CES, there's a lot of stupid. So I, I have to point out the, uh, the hula hoop, the connected hula hoop. <laughs> I saw the weight as much as a cinder block or two, but only cost seventy dollars. So that's my uh, least favorite IoT device. My least favorite segment is smart city. Uh, I think in decades it's going to be loaded with stuff. Monetization of smart city in the next few years is brutal, my opinion. But anyway, um, stupidest thing I'm going to take back three years ago to CES was the connected toothbrush. <laughs> uh, but uh, we could have pet trackers. We have so many of these damn things yes. that just drive you nuts, you know, um, a, a, around the place. I fortunately missed CES. I was actually paddling up the Amazon, so I didn't go to Las Vegas. That's why I saw none of the crap of this mm. year. Um, uh, what was the second part of the question? Least attractive area of investment in IoT. Um, oh, interesting. Um, Anything that has the word platform in it. <laughs> <laughs> you took mine. I mean, you know, the silliest thing you know, at CES was Nissan's brain to machine interface. Oh, just really? For the, yeah, just oh. silly. 
I would, ha I would have to say, there, you know, companies that are doing uh, project consulting and integration, you know, they're much needed in a lot of cases, but I wouldn't put my dollars as an investment. The money, the money uh, is not, that, not you, obviously there. Yeah, that's right. It walks out the door every day. Yeah. Yep. Not without IP associated. Okay, okay, real quick, the rest of uh, our answers. I, I would just say uh, some of the consumer stuff. I mean, there are a lot of these sort of Fitbits, and we've seen like connected sneakers and connected frying pans and all that. And I just, to me, it seems like a low barrier <coughs> type of proposition. Yeah. You know, it's weird. I'm, I don't think I'm the best judge because I went to CES, and when I came home, three people asked me, Did I see the robot that folds clothes? And when I heard about it, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing. But they were like, Boy, that would be. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't ask about the Samsung wall television set, 146 inches. I know you have a good one, James. Faraday cage underwear. There you go. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> All right, folks, please a nice round of applause for our panel. and especially our